रहे हैं वेलकम टू फ्रेंड्स इन फिक्शन फाइव बेस्ट सेलिंग ऑथर्स एंड द स्टोरीज नावलिस्ट मेरी के एंड्रूज क्रिस्टन हार्मेल क्रिस्टी वुडसन हार्वी Patty Callahan Henry and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Good evening and welcome to Friends in Fiction. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey and I'll be your host tonight. I am Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Mary Alice Monroe. I'm Kristen Harmel. <laughs> and I'm Mary Kay Andrews. <laughs> we have been so looking forward to tonight's episode where we will chat with our good friends Susan Meisner and Greer McAllister about their new novels and how they build the extraordinary historical worlds in their books. We'll give all of you a chance to ask some questions live, so feel so feel free to drop them in the comments. And of course, we won't let Sue and Greer get away without giving us a writing tip and telling us what they're reading now. So it was a big week at our house here with both Noah and Jason's birthdays and my in-laws coming to visit. So everything was crazy, everything was nuts, but fortunately I had a pantry stocked with Mama Geraldine's cheese straws, conveniently our partner here on Friends in Fiction. Mm -hmm. And I love them so much. I've already gone through my first shipment. I'm on my second shipment. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, I knew that at least snacks were taken care of in the midst of all the chaos this week. So remember, if you order from Mama Geraldine's, you can use code FAB5 for 20% off at Mama geraldines.com and as usual snack on y'all you guys made the one non-southerner say that that's crazy <laughs> we're, we're trying to adopt doing a very you, Kristen. good job come on you did a did really good thing right? y'all you y'all yeah. you got it you did it just right several oh, syllables I'm, i'm one of you thank you <laughs> We'd also like to thank our partner Page One Books, an independent bookstore subscription that hand selects books for you based on your preferences. So they don't just send the same book to everybody. They pick one for just you based on what you like. The owner Brandy, her love of books started when she was just a child, and the bookstore in her hometown let her work for them and stock shelves in exchange for Nancy Drew books. Great. <laughs> so if you saw us um last week talking about our literary crushes, mine was Ned Nickerson, mm -hmm. who was Nancy Drew's boyfriend. So Brandy and I already <laughs> are bonded and Page One is giving 10% off subscriptions with the code FAB5 and more information is available under announcements on our Facebook page. Amazing. All right, well let's bring in USA Today best-selling author of The Arctic Fury, Greer McAllister, and award-winning author of The Nature of Fragile Things, Susan Meisner. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Hi. So glad you're here. We are so glad you're here. And before we start talking about your amazing books, We wanted to talk about something else. Um, as a lot of you out there might know, we have started partnering with Parade Magazine, and um, there is a Friends in Fiction column on Parade.com every week. And this week, our darling Kristen Harmel wrote about how she is finding light in the darkness of the pandemic, and that resonated with me so much. So we wanted to ask um, all of you tonight, how are you finding light during the darkness? Susan, can you start us off? Putting you on the spot. Oh, so <laughs> oh gosh, you know, for me, I mentioned this earlier um, during a promotional time for this particular episode of Friends in Fiction that I'm holding on to hope right now. Hope is what lights my way because I have to believe that we're going to turn a corner and that we'll turn it soon and that this will be in the rear view and that we're not always going to be like we are right now. And so it's that hope that gets me through each day, uh, the hard days and even the easy days. It's, it's hope that I'm holding on to. Yeah. Mm. What it, what is the poet say? Hope is that thing with with wings. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hope is yeah. 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 I I feel the same way. I feel like yeah. also the that I've I'm holding on to like it's the stories, whether it's your book, Greer's book, mm-hmm. our books. There's something about stories that light the way too. Because mm-hmm. I found when I was a kid and it stuck with me that in the books things start to work out. You know, yeah. things start to things things work out in a book. And so books have always offered me hope. Greer, how about you? Yeah, I love I love both of those answers. And to be honest, it's things like this for me that that you know, when when you're talking about when you have a new book come out in in the ordinary world in the before times, if you're very lucky, you go on a book tour and you get to meet a certain number of readers at a certain number of bookstores. But the silver lining of, of all of the book events going online in the pan- pandemic is I can be in conversation with any author anywhere. I can work with any bookstore anywhere. Um, and I get to have conversations like these, uh, which is really, really wonderful for me. So uh, that's that's what I'm doing these days. I have to agree. I'm going to actually pick up on both of your comments. One is the seeing other authors. This show coming in every week and talking to the authors has been a a light every week. And then reading, reading, of course, bibliotherapy, but to read the books. And I'm reading so many, many more books because y'all are giving us your books (laughs) to read, you know, the delight of your books, but just to sit in and escape has been really wonderful. I'm reading different books new books, new authors. It's been a real treat being part of this whole program. I think what's helped me is to think about kindness. Um, You know, uh, we, for some reason, um, neighbors and and old friends have had some tragedies and some stuff happening in in their, in their lives. And so my daughter and I both love to cook and we sort of (laughs) with a food ministry. Um, so we, <laughs> you know, we, uh, my husband and I like to cook together and we'll fix um, enough to share. We have a couple of bachelor neighbors and we call them and say, Hey, we have lasagna or we have, you know, we bake cookies. And, and so that, that's helped me remember kindness. Um, I think it's, it's sort of a, a life raft to cling to in, in, in times that are perilous. Wait, it's so true. And, and that's one of the things I said in the essay today, the idea that it's those small sparks of light that come together to light the flame that sees us through. I mean, it's that idea of doing the little things in your own corner of the world, you know, whether it's extending kindness to a neighbor or picking up the phone to call someone who, you know, whose day you're capable of brightening or, you know, or going out and supporting an independent bookseller who, who yeah. needs that support, yeah. all of those little things add up to the big things. Um, and, and so I really think that in times like these, you have to find the ways to find your own light, to light your own light. Yeah. Mm, I love that. That's so true. And that was such a such a beautiful essay. Um, and Greer, your new release, The Arctic Fury, and Susan, your new release, The Nature of Fragile Things, are both so spectacularly transportive. Um, and so for sure, reading them helped me find a sliver of light this week. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, and so, um, Greer, can you tell us a little bit about the Arctic Fury? Sure. So the Arctic Fury is uh, historical fiction set in the 1850s, and it's sort of a what if story loosely inspired by uh, real people and real events. Um, I'm going to see if I can, nope, point in the right direction here. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, um, isn't it? It's it's the <laughs> They're all around. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the Arctic Fury is about um, a group of, of 13 women who go north in search of the Lost Franklin Expedition, which was a real Arctic expedition that, that sailed off and never came back. Um, and so in my story, 13 women go north, um, and then it follows what happens when not all of them come back. So it's a it's an action adventure story. There's a murder trial, so I got to write courtroom scenes, which I had not uh, done previously. Um, and it's, uh, it, as Christy so so lovingly put it, it's, it's transportive. Um, I want to carry you away. And unfortunately, the weather being what it has been in so many parts of the uh, country lately, um, I don't want to add to the cold that's often <laughs> out there. But, um, <laughs> Get the book, sit by a warm fire, you know, have a dog on your feet, hot chocolate, whatever you need to to gather your own warmth when you're reading about these very cold events. As well, we should just embrace it, though, I think, you know, just really go all in on the cold. <laughs> Unless you um, live or, in Texas. Yeah, well, that's I true. know. 
Or, or you know, so right now. it's a way f- for Floridians like me to experience the winter that That's everyone right. else has experienced. Ah, so yeah, all, all, of, all of you Floridians, sort of. buy Greer's book. <laughs> this is winter. <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Um, Susan, can you tell us just a little about the nature of fragile things? Sure. Well, it's set during the backdrop of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. So it's kind of the before, the during, and then the the after. And I use that imagery of the whole world seeming like it's crumbling beneath your feet to tell the story of a mail order bride whose world literally cracks open um, on the eve of the earthquake, not just the physical world, but like her, her whole world begins to crumble because she's married a man that she's realizing is not who he said he was. And so it's it's about making tough choices when, when, when it seems like the world is crumbling beneath your feet. And, and you know, what a, what a perfect thing kind of for these times, right? Um, Susan, I, I loved your book and you know, I loved your book because I, I blurbed it early. I, I just thought you transported us to that world so well, um, so skillfully. So, I, you know, reading it, I was right there in the story world of San Francisco during that time period, both pre and post earthquake. Um, you drew both worlds, I think, just so well, um, you know, but kind of the, the, the before and the after. So I know just from reading it that you did a ton of research to create this world, to create, to, to paint it so vividly. Can you discuss a little bit about what drew you to this earthquake story and how you managed to create the world so accurately, but also to draw mm. such realistic characters with such true to life details? They, they honestly felt like real true people drawn from history. Mm. Yep. Well, that's the nicest thing you could say. Thank you. Well, I chose it mainly because I've been writing historical fiction for a while and I've been hopping all over the globe in different locales to find stories to tell. And I just haven't spent much time thinking about my own home state. I'm from California. I was born and raised in California. And I thought, you know, there's probably stories right here waiting to be told. And I haven't been looking for them. And, and the first one that came to mind was the San Francisco earthquake, because it was a pretty definitive moment for San Francisco. Pretty famous earthquake. And yet I didn't see very many novels that used the earthquake as a backdrop you know, for a story. So that, that interested me. Also because it was easier to research because it's easy. Well, when we were traveling, it was easy for me to get to San Francisco because I live in San Diego. So that part was attractive to me. And there's a lot written about it from a, from a nonfiction point of view. So I felt like I had a lot to look at as far as um, nonfiction treatments of the story, memoirs and biographies, autobiographies, diaries, newspaper articles. There was a lot of there were a lot of literary remains from the earthquake, so I felt like I, I had what I needed to, um, to to build a fictional world because my characters aren't real; they're not based on a real story of any kind. Yeah. But I I I wanted to give that really amazing backdrop of this this quake and the, and how people um, survived it to um, a set of characters that that could somehow use that that I could kind of exploit the backdrop, if you will to tell a story about um, a mail order bride whose world cracks open for, uh, for other reasons just before the earthquake. And actually this book had some, had some false starts. I had to start it twice. Wow. And I'm really grateful for my wonderful editor because she had to tell me twice after having written 40,000 words and then 20,000 oh. that I was gonna have to probably start over. Oh, oh. Wow. You know, You're wow. giving me heart failure. I know. Oh, you know yeah, that's... Me. I, I'm really grateful for her. I, in fact, if you get the book, you'll see that it's dedicated to Claire. She's my editor because oh. I feel like there would be no if I didn't have her in my life. And I know those two times, and we were we were in we were actually in person both of those times. Once I was in New York meeting with her, she had to tell me this is not going to work, and we were having a lovely lunch at the time too. Oh. And then the second time she had to tell me we were at the HNS conference in Washington D.C. and having a lovely lunch. And I had just sent her 20,000 new words and she said, it's not going to work. <laughs> she was right. And it was because I hadn't dialed in. I hadn't dialed in to what my characters mm-hmm. wanted and why they wanted it. And those two things are so important. You've got to know what the character wants. And then so deeper true. than that is why do they want those things? And then what stands in their way? And I just didn't, I didn't, I hadn't dialed into it. And so that third time was the charm. It really took me to the mat though. But because she sent me back twice, I, oh I came gosh. away with the book I'm really happy with. That's now, if she, if she had invited you to lunch one more time, would you have gone? Or would you have just been like, <laughs> nope, nope. I was going to say, you're never going to have lunch with her again. 
you know, I was, I was beginning to feel like, you know, it's like you, you have maybe a gift and it just departs. And uh, so I, I was really grateful when the third, the third time she wrote to me and said, you nailed it. So, yay. Oh, and that's what I, you want to hear. Yeah. You nailed I concur. it. You did. You nailed it. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. I think it's worth top, all the false starts. Yeah. I think a top editor is really, is really what we all need. Even those of us who've yeah. written, you know, a dozen, two dozen yeah. books. A, a tough, of course, you have to trust your editor's taste, right? Yes. Yes. Well, it's a and gift to have an editor you trust. Say, yeah, she wouldn't say, it, it's. Um, here's what you need to fix. She would just say, this won't work. And she really handed it back to me and said, you know, try again. So I felt like I still had full creative control. Um, but, but she did tell me when I needed to know it, that I, that the story I was writing would it would not it would not deliver the goods, and she was right. Yeah, better to get get that news mm -hmm. twenty or forty thousand words in than hundred thousand <laughs> words in, and from your editor instead of from readers. Yes, yes. yeah, just one person. Yes, <laughs> always. Very you true. know, I don't know about you all, but I I think we all get those questions from new writers or. Um, wannabe writers who say, how do you handle it when your editor, you know, how could you let your baby um, be slaughtered by an editor? And I don't think they realize uh, what a great gift uh, yeah. a discriminating editor is. Yes, 100%. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a great question from one of our um, wonderful Friends in Fiction members, Anissa Joy Armstrong, and she wants to know, which part of the writing process do you enjoy the most? Research, research, writing or editing? Kara, why don't you start us off? I, I like being done uh, after <laughs> all of those parts. When I'm, I'm like, say, here's my book and drink champagne. champagne. Uh, that's, my favorite part. that's my favorite part. Uh, <laughs> too. That's a really good part. <laughs> Um, but there's something about the, the that initial writing. I write what I call um, a messy first draft or sometimes fondly first draft trash um, <laughs> where it's just I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm writing and I don't care I like whether the words are any good. I know most of them aren't, but I'm just watching that word count climb and climb and climb. And then I get that very messy first draft done. So I like the possibility of that. I like the openness of that. And then the real work happens during revision. But I like the just when the words are flowing. I love that part. And can we answer it as well? Yes, yes, please, Susan. <laughs> I definitely prefer the research part as far as enjoyment because it's all like mining for treasure. That part's lovely and it's fun to go down the different rabbit trails. And I feel like I have a lot of um, latitude to do that because you never know what you might find. So I always feel like I can go wherever I want to in this research dive because it could all end up being and I could, you know, find something I never would have guessed if I hadn't gone down the, the rabbit trail. And then, of course, yeah. you know, once the yeah. writing starts, then it's a very concentrated task where I feel like I don't have all that latitude to do whatever I want. And so the research part is enjoy is enjoyable. It's broadening. It's fun. The writing part is really when I feel like I have to I have to settle into the work, which is also in, enjoyable, but only when you're done, really, because the, the writing itself can be very um, exhausting mentally. It feels yeah. really good to be done, though. Mm -hmm. It certainly does. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone that we'll be taking live questions soon, so get them in now. And Susan and Greer, you know that part of the reason that we started the show was to support independent bookstores during this difficult time. And y'all chose the amazing Warwick's in La Jolla, which I know is a favorite of all of ours. So I just wanted to let all of our viewers and listeners out there know that you can get 10% off of Greer and Susan's books, as well as the upcoming books from the five of us with the code Warwick's Friends. Mary Alice, I think you have um, something that you want to I talk to I do. I just wanted to remind everybody um, to ask too, why Sue did you choose this bookstore? Oh, Warwick's is like my hometown bookstore. It's um, my favorite indie and it's been in San Diego for ages, for more than a century. It's my favorite place to be if I have money to spend. <laughs> and the beautiful little beach enclave. It's such a lovely, um, the, the location is beautiful. Everything about the bookstore is wonderful because it's surrounded by beauty 
and it's full mm. of books. And, and it's also, it also has a gift section too. They got the funnest gifts ever. So it's my <laughs> favorite bookstore, and it's where I like to have my my launch when I'm able to have a launch. Yeah. We couldn't have it, you know, this year. Um, yeah. But it, it's when we do have a launch there, they let me throw a big party, and it's just um, and it's an amazing bookstore that feels like it belongs to me personally. I love well, it. Well, tonight we're doing a sort of launch. <laughs> we're having, we're honoring the bookstore tonight. All right. Well, let's. Yeah. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, this is a big night for research. The two of you both really dive in. And Greer, for the Arctic Fury, I really identified with Lady Jane Franklin. She was such a, a, a wonderfully strong woman and tireless in trying to find her husband's lost expedition. And that was, that was a major thing in that time in history where they were going off and exploring the world and here these women go off, which was so cool. So I'm curious, though, what what sparked your interest in this particular story? It's not, you know, something that pops up in our news like the 1906 earthquake. You know, this is more quiet. So how did you find this? And can you give us a little bit of insight into the research that you did? Sure, sure. Um, the first time that I heard about the Franklin Expedition was in graduate school because I read about it. It, it was an extremely Canadian thing. I read about it in a Margaret Atwood short story. Uh, <laughs> wow. okay. Very Canadian. <laughs> Super Canadian and wonderful in her writing. I just, I love everything she writes, but this particular story um, was around the time that um, sh they figured out that it might have been the um, poorly sealed lead cans that that did in the expedition. You know, when they when they sent um, Britain sent just waves and waves of of men and ships looking for the Northwest Passage, and so they would just assume that the ships would probably get stuck in the ice at some point, and they would sail and they would get stuck in the ice and stay there over the winter, and then wait for the ice to thaw and then sail a little bit farther. So they all took a lot of provisions, and so the. Um, the, the Franklin expedition had let the job of, of stocking that food go to the lowest bidder uh, and their food went bad. Um, that had been discovered at some point. So they still don't know exactly what happened and at what point things things went um, went south, even though they went north. Um, but uh, but that was what the short story was about. And so I was interested in, in finding out more about this, this story. And it's a very male story. It's very, it's, mm -hmm. it's all these men going and, and looking right. and looking and dying and sometimes coming back and sometimes not. Um, and I read a wonderful book about it also called uh, The Voyage of the Narwhal by Andrea Barrett. Oh, yes. And it's about an, an American who joins an expedition looking for Franklin. And it has female characters in it, but they're very sort of what you would consider typical women of the period who are waiting around for the men to come home. Um, and I wanted to write a story that was not that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was no, uh, as far as we know, there was no all female expedition that went north at this time. But the more research I read, the more I thought, well, there could have been because there were women in the 1840s and 1950s who were battlefield nurses or they were taking their entire family across the continent on the Oregon Trail or the California Trail or they were married to trappers, or there were women who would, would sail with scientific expeditions as illustrators. You know, we get this very sort of locked box idea of the Victorian age as well, men went out and did things and women stayed home. Um, and most of the men went out and most of the women stayed home, but there are lots of, lots of very, very interesting sure. exceptions. So I wanted to write about those interesting exceptions. Um, and the good thing about this this time was it was basically the job of these explorers to document things. So I would have, um, you know, contemporary, uh, you know, contemporary accounts like the journals of John Ray, who wrote everything down. Um, and then fabulous sort of when they did finally find these ships, by the way, they were found in 2014 and 2016. For oh an my gosh! Expedition, it's like the Pulaski. Uh, yeah, so they've been they've been sitting there. Well, oh yeah, exactly. Like like um, like Penny's new book. Um, but you know, I was able to find a lot of research as opposed to when I was writing about the first female Pinkerton detective. Um, mm. Am I going to point it? There we go. Um, Girl in disguise, the first female Pinkerton detective, Kate Warren. There was almost nothing in the historical record about her. I went to the Pinkerton archives at the Library of Congress and read everything that was written about her. In in 
under three hours. So it was, you can sort of, when you're doing historical fiction, you can find a bounty, you can mm-hmm. find a dearth. Um, yeah. But I, mm-hmm. I like to look at the gaps in the historical record as an invitation. Um, oh, I like that. I love that. What instead. a great phrase. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd always be wanting to make stuff up. <laughs> yeah. That's a line I'm going to remember. It's mm-hmm. an invitation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I Looking at your book, and I see all those tabs. I'm I like, yeah, I know that. I know that load. You yeah. know, you find the right book yeah. that has the mm-hmm. right information. And what you just said about the gaps, I think we all just went, ah, because mm-hmm. I always say I'm so much more interested in the untold part of a story mm-hmm. than the part of the story that we repeat over and over, the part of the story mm-hmm. that everybody thinks they know. Right. But it's never never the full story. And it is fiction. You know, we can take these leaps of faith. Yeah. Wait, we try. (laughs) So we have something we love to talk about with all of our guests. And so I'm going to ask both of you. Growing up, what were your family's values around reading and writing? I always think it's so interesting to know what it was like in your house growing up, and then how did that shape the writers you became? So Susan, you wanna go first? That's a great question. Well, I grew up with um, bookcases in every room of the house. So books always seem to me like just part of the, it's the part of the home was having bookcases. They were in the living room, they were in the dining room, they were down the hall. There was even a little collection of things to read in the bathroom. It was just like- Oh yes, of course. <laughs> there was always books everywhere. And um, you know, I got my first library card when I was eight years old. And I feel like um, my, my parents didn't have to, um, they just modeled that behavior because they bought books and filled the house with books and they encouraged us to read. And I think it just it just seemed like a normal thing. Like it was normal to have books in the house, like it was normal to have toilet paper in the house. It was just it was just part of, of a normal of a normal childhood. And I, I I appreciate it now so much more that when I came home from school, remember those scholastic things we'd come home from school with the really thin paper newsprint and yep. and you know you'd pick out the yep. one you want. My parents always said yes. It was never like, oh, we're, no, not this time. But they, I always yeah. went to school yeah. the next day with my scholastic order. And that also seemed normal to me. And I realize now, no, they made the, they made the choice to let me do that, you know, whenever there was a scholastic order at school. So I appreciate the fact that they normalized reading. It was just part of having air to breathe is having books do you, in the house. Do you I feel like that, that made you the well, writer that, was, that you are today or contributed to the writer so, that you are today? So. Yeah, you know, my dad was a technical writer. He spent his career as a technical writer. So I feel like there's a writing gene going around in my in my family. And I feel like my kids kind of have it too. Like my daughter is an editor. She's a really good writer. And, and I have a son who's a lawyer. He's a really good writer. And I think okay. it's because there's a gene that's been um, passed around in the family. And they're all readers. They all have books in their homes too. And um, we didn't, it was kind of the same thing. Books were in the house just like, carpets and chairs and tables. Oh, I love and, that. And like I, carpets and I, chairs. Yeah. But yeah the, the, my kids, our kids have, have the same thing going on in their homes. Books are a prominent, they're a prominent feature. That's so cool. How about you, Greer? What were the values like in your house when you were growing up? Yeah, I'll talk about the writing part of it because I think the, the the book part of it sounds very familiar and very, very dear to me as well. Um, but the writing part of it, I was a writer from a very young age, but I was not a good writer from a very young age. So what I loved was just that my teachers and my parents didn't care whether it was any good or not. (laughs) They were very encouraging anyway. Um, That's that's a really important part of a writer's journey is not getting shouted down, not getting corrected over and over again. And we need some shaping, right? We need, we need some guidance, but just that, that spark, um, nurturing that spark and helping me move forward with it and, and helping me share stories and um, that, you know, that really built, you know, built the fire stronger. So I was so glad that that was part of how I was raised, not, not, not being told you'll never make a living doing this, not being told this yeah. isn't what you should be spending your time on, but being told, you know, here's some paper and a pencil, go to town. Um, and that, um, that, that has, has moved me forward. Mm. I always say there was, there were times where, um, in, in, when I was a child writing books and stapling them together and painting the covers, uh-huh. you know, they would never say, this is awful. But when you got to school, 
that's when they would say, you know, but it sounds like you had teachers who lifted you up instead of saying this isn't something you should do. Yes. Yes. My teachers were always encouraging other kids, not necessarily, but I okay. listen to them, I, which is also a very important part of being a writer, d- developing yeah. yourself not to listen to. <laughs> Ooh, so very true. true. Really cool. yeah. Well, I just think it's fascinating. And I always wonder if we grew up in a different kind of family or, mm-hmm. or didn't have parents who encouraged or had bookcases as furniture, you know, would any of us be doing what we do or, or is that part of it? So thanks y'all. I love hearing about that. I, love hearing mm-hmm. about that. I always love the answer to that question. And sometimes it surprises us too. It's not yep. always, yes, books were like groceries. I mean, sometimes yep. it's something very different than what we expect. Yep. Um, well, you all know our members are so amazing and they have so many things they want to ask you. So we are going to, um, pass the baton to them a little bit. And then we are going to be asking um, Susan and Greer for their writing tips and about what they're reading now. So make sure you stick around. So our first question from a reader, other than Anissa, who I know we already had the Anissa question, is uh, we have one from Jenny Collins-Belk that said, both of these seasoned writers always present memorable historical fiction. I would like to know why they chose historical fiction to write. That's a great question. Greer, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, My story is that I totally accidentally did it and I didn't mean to. Uh, So The Magician's Lie, uh, The Magician's Lie was my first work of historical fiction. And really, I just wanted to set a story in the past. And I didn't think about it as, okay, I'm making a decision to write historical fiction. But I wanted to write a story about a female magician who cuts men in half because I had heard so many stories about male stage magicians cutting women in half. And I thought, well, well, maybe maybe the reverse is true and I just hadn't heard about it. I'm not like a, an expert in the field or anything, but the more research I did, the more I'm like, nope, nope, it's really just always the men cutting the women in half uh, <laughs> until the 1980s. That was the first time that a woman wow. became famous as a stage magician for, for making cutting a man in half her signature illusion. So then I thought, well, do I want to write about the 80s? Hmm. Um, you know, I already went through it once. I don't think I need to, to set it then. And I didn't want to set it as a contemporary story, because today stage magic is something totally different. It's Vegas. It's, you know, I was going to say David Copperfield, but it's not even David Copperfield anymore. It's Chris Angel or somebody. Um, Penn and Teller. It's Penn and Teller on TV. That's what it is. Um, But totally different, right? So I wanted to write about a woman in the golden age of magic. And when I started researching, I found out that was sort of the 1880s through the through the early 1900s. And that's when the story had to be set. So I I sort of found my way into it. But that book took five years to write because I wasn't I wasn't doing it right. <laughs> um, I would stop writing to go find a fact. And and as I think as all historical fiction writers now know, don't stop writing. Um, but I had to I had to learn that the hard way. So you now I'm. Now all of now all of my ideas are historical fiction ideas because that's what I'm researching and reading about and and into. Well, Greer, I, I loved that book. That was your first or my my first of yours that I read. I, I enjoyed that very much. So that's Thank cool you. to hear how you get into that. How about you, Susan? Yeah, I think for me, I kind of stumbled into it also. I was writing contemporary fiction. I enjoyed it. But then in, in 2008, I wrote a dual timeline story uh, that dovetailed the Salem Witch Trials with a current day character. And I found that I just really liked it. I really liked it. And that book did well. Like I was, it, it won some awards. And so I feel like I was validated in that way. And I thought, well, if I like it and the readers like it, maybe this is what I should be doing. And so I just stayed in this lane. And I really do feel like it's the place I need to be. I think historical fiction is unique in that it's, it can take you back to the past without having to time travel. And great books about history, and there are some really good ones, they can really only tell you what it was like, but fiction lets you feel what it was like. And I feel like that is something unique about fiction and history is that you learn about the past by almost experiencing it. And I think we learn different things when we experience something rather than just like reading about it. But if a book is really transportive and you felt like you've gone back into the past, into the character's head, their heart and their soul, well, you're going to learn the same lessons they did in, in almost the same way, not quite. And I think that's one of the reasons, too, why I feel like historical fiction, not only do I like it, I feel like it has a unique place in the literary world. It's mm-hmm. so true, because I think when you learn historical facts, they get filed away in your brain. But when mm-hmm. you feel the historical facts and, and the emotions that surround them, 
it it permeates everything you are, you know, because it becomes yeah. part of your heart. That was such a good way to put it, Susan. Thank you. Actually, I think I do. I think that's really true for both your books is that we really felt we were there. We felt what they were suffering and enduring. But now I'm going to switch a little bit. Alex, Alexis Crosby has a great question, which I love. Alexis Crosby Lavoie, I think. Is there any one family member in your family that is a book critic regarding your books? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? I don't know if I would uh, call her a book critic, and I know she's listening too. So I'm going to talk about my mom. Um, but you know, it, when you get the advice setting out as a writer, they say you know find a cr find a critical reader, like find a beta reader. Don't just give it to your mom to because because of course all she's going to do is have praise for it. But my mom was a communications teacher. Um, and, a, and an avid reader and a wonderful, brilliant, creative mind on top of that. And so I gave my mom a, an early draft of one of my books to read. And she gave me a 19-page editorial letter. Can we have her number? Can we <laughs> have her email? Can we have her email? I send it to my mom so that she'll say it's perfect, perfect. and I love it. <laughs> but wow. Now, did that burn? Did moms give you the editorial feedback that you need. I think yeah. my daughter would hit me over the head with it if, you know, if I, if I did that to her. <laughs> what about you, Susan? Do you have that family member? Yeah, that is so funny, Greer, because my mom does that for me too. But she actually is my proofreader. She's the only person. In fact, I thank her in every book. Her name is Judy Horning. So if you have any of my books and you open it, you'll you'll see my mom's name there oh, because she's the only one who sees it. I don't have any critique partners or critique groups. Nobody sees what I write until... I turn it into my editor. I don't know why I'm that way. I just always have been, but she gets to see it because I want to turn in something clean and she's a really good proofreader. So she proofreads for me, but she'll also um, put little comments on the margins. Like if she feels like maybe um, this isn't quite right, or maybe this might feel a little contrived or a little hokey mm -hmm. or she always captures it in really nice language, which is really sweet of her. And I don't know if she's watching, but she might be. So thanks mom. So I feel uh. like, I get the proofread that I need so I can get rid of all the stupid little mechanical mistakes so that my editor gets a really good clean read. But I also have just a you know a little extra um, information about how to make it also a, a good read from, from her. So yeah. That's perfect. That's so fascinating that it's both of your moms that oh, you give it to. That's really fascinating. Cause I, I don't, I, do, do any of y'all's moms read your work before it goes to the editor? Nope. Yeah, no. my mom does. My mom and um, two of my aunts, they read every really? book. Yeah, they're my first readers. And they um, you know, my mom just walked in my house and she heard me say that. And she went, <laughs> <laughs> hi, mom. <laughs> they yeah. just got off a five hour drive and walked in the door. But, oh, um, welcome but yeah, home. so I, I like them to read it first. And they are um, they're really good proofreaders. And um, and they'll ask me good questions, but they're also like very complimentary. And I need that, especially in, that, in those early stages. But this past year, my sisters have read a lot of my work and it's been really interesting, oh. you know, so it's been it's been a real joy. But the, I think they're careful, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> they're careful. It's hard. I, I I give it to them when it's published and in a hardcover, and I give it to them with their name yes. in it. And now um, all they do is say thank you. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, they probably say more when I'm not listening. But um, okay, y'all. Tracy Mile Lado said, "My question for both authors is: the topics for your books are so unique and fresh. How much time does it take for both of you to decide what to write mm. about?" Is there research involved in deciding what the next story will be? Greer, you want to go first? Yeah, I think it, it varies for me. I sort of always have a list going of things that I might want to write about. And then it does take a certain amount of digging oh, to figure do. out whether there's something there or not. So I have a lot of ideas about, you know, like I might have little notes that are like crime in New Orleans, you know, and and then I have to like yeah. dig a little deeper and, and try a few different things to decide if I really have something to say about it, if, if, you know, if it's something that I'm capable of writing at this point in my career. And so, yeah, there's, it varies by book. Um, some things really okay. just click. Um, the Arctic Fury just clicked. I said, I want to write a book set in the Arctic. I don't read enough of them. Um, so there should be more. <laughs> <laughs> What's the longest it's taken you 
to decide which book you want to write next? Um, for me, it's, it's, I don't I've had one come out every two years for the past okay. eight years, I guess. <laughs> um, so never, never longer than I contractually have to. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, how about you, Susan? How how much time does it take for you to decide not not to write the book, but to decide mm -hmm. what to write about? I feel like I'm always thinking about the next book, even when I'm already writing the next book. So like right mm -hmm. now, I'm in the middle of writing the next book, but I'm already thinking about what I might want to write about next. So I'm not really sure how long it takes because it seems like it's always on the back burner, always in the back of my yep. mind. And I keep a file too. Like I, I keep articles I read in the New York Times or National Geographic or Smithsonian, and I'll tuck them in this file. And it could be a, an event, it could be a place, it could be like a, a, a person whose life um, inspires me. And I'll, I'll go through that file when it's time to pick an idea. But oftentimes, nice. I've already kind of landed on something, you know, before then. So I, I feel like it's always, that is always a pot on the back of the stove. It's always just kind of simmering a little bit. And, um, and any, anything really can spark an idea. It's, it's funny, sometimes some of the things in that file, I, I look at them later and I wonder why did I put that in there? Because I, it's not immediately, immediately clear what was it about that little article or, some, or whatever it is that, in, that interested me. But um, yeah, it's, I, I feel like it, there's always, I feel like there's a treasure trove of ideas out there. And even though it seems like more and more historical fiction is hitting the shelves, I think there are still ideas out there. I don't think we've run dry of ideas. No, and it's funny how what will happen to me is I'll think, oh, no, I'm not going to have another idea. I'm, it's just not going to happen. And I'm going to dry up and then I'll be halfway through a book and and, and it'll start flirting from over here. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, yeah. out of the corner of my eye, it'll start flirting. I'm like, OK. And, and you almost have to make yourself focus on the book that you're working yes. on. Right. Yeah. That's so true. I, I do the same, the exact same thing, but I always like to know that something else is coming. So I don't feel yep. panicky and without ideas. Um, Greer, Evelyn um, wanted to know if you could tell us the short story that inspired your book. Do you remember the name of it? I wish I did remember okay. the name of it. I will try to find it and put it on um, my Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, okay. like some sort of okay. social thing, but off the top of my head, I cannot recall. Okay, sorry. I hate to put you on the spot. Okay, I'll do. Um, so one of <laughs> if you favorite... remember, tell us. We'll put yeah. it on the Friends and Fiction. Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say that. We absolutely will. So one of our favorite parts of our weekly show is getting to hear from our amazing authors about um, one of their writing tips. So, um, Susan, do you have a tip that you could share with our readers? Sure. Our well, writers. <laughs> This is something that I've kind of um, come to just in this last year, maybe maybe because of the pandemic, but I've been writing chapters on the notes app on my phone outside on the patio. And oh. it's it's very freeing. I, I didn't realize how wonderful it would be just to sit outside with my notes app and my phone. And it's nothing amazing. I don't have special voice recognition software. It's just it's just an Apple iPhone. But if I if I can see the scene that's happening in my head, I can start talking the scene. I'll just talk it. And then all the dialogue wow. seems very natural because I'm speaking it into my phone. So the dialogue comes across way more natural than it would if I was writing it. The only the only trouble is when you when you come inside then and you you mail that note to yourself and then open it up on your email and drop it into a Word doc is sometimes Siri doesn't always hear everything correctly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit garbled and it's a little bit like the game Mad Gab where you're trying to figure out what did I say? What did she hear? <laughs> but for the most part, it I, it allowed me to write 96,000 words during COVID, which oh, I, whoa. Yeah, right? I, and I think for a lot of us authors, we've been trying to find our, like the muse has been kind of in gauzy, ethereal place during this pandemic. And a lot of us have felt like, I don't know if I... If, I, if I'm able to channel my creativity with all of this going on. So I have found that speaking the scenes into my phone, I was able to write like 2000 words in an hour, which that never happened. Oh I know. So I would say just, if you're a writer, just give it a try and see if that doesn't just free up your mind and your creativity and allow you to write more words per day than you thought. That is so interesting because I feel like I'll be driving down the road sometimes and I'll be like, I am a genius and I will, you know, voice text or note or whatever to myself. And then I get home and I'm like, 
that is horrible. It sounds <laughs> awful. And how was I thinking that that was going to be good? So there's definitely something about like fingers on keys for me that has to happen, but I'm going to give it another go. Like when I'm, you know, just hanging out and like feeling calm and centered. <laughs> Maybe that's the difference is I'm, I'm not usually driving. I'm usually sitting <laughs> right. outside and I'm very focused on what I'm doing. Like yeah. I'm very focused. I'm in the story, almost like I'm the direct, I'm directing the movie and the characters are, are on stage and I'm telling them, this is what you're going to do. And here, here are your beats. And, oh. and then you know, off they go. Ah, so I love cool. this. Yeah. I'm going to try that. Definitely. Yeah. Too. Never yeah. Done. All right, Greer, what about you? Do you have a tip to share? I will share my tip very quickly. Somebody uh, on Facebook says they think the short story might be, might be the age of lead, which awesome. sounds like it could definitely be. It it. We'll confirm that and we'll, okay. we'll put it on the page. Um, but my you. writing tip is a, a two part tip. One, don't give up. Because I really feel yeah. like what separates the the writers who who break through from the ones who don't isn't necessarily talent. It's more just like being willing to you know beat your head against a wall for yeah. a longer period of time. Um, so don't give up. Like the only person who can really prevent you from getting where you want to be is is you. Um, and the second is don't go it alone. Because as you see here, like one of the best things about being a writer is writer friends, and it doesn't have to be you know. You don't all have to be at the same level of publishing. You don't all have to be publishing the same type of thing. Um, but just other people who who understand, it helps you sort of burden your other friends less too. Yeah, <laughs> you too. And your family. All your other friends. Yeah. Oh, the most anticipated books of next year and I'm not on it and I'm really mad and and regular <laughs> yeah. friends don't understand. Um, but, but writer friends are like, yeah, I'm not on it either. And then you go back to like doing the things that you need to do to actually move forward um but you can bet <laughs> with each other and you can talk yeah. to each other and you yeah. can bounce ideas off of each other and it's just is unless you really really are an introverted person who doesn't like to to interact mm -hmm. with other people um try to find at least one writer friend two writer friends yeah. three writer friends that you yeah. can sort of be be together with it's great advice it's great yep, absolutely. Those are, yeah those are thank great you. Yes. thank you um you know our readers love hearing what you guys are reading what other authors are reading. So we would love to hear um, your book recommendations. Susan, do you have one? And then we'll hear from Greer. I do. Well, the one I just finished this morning, honestly, was this one. It is so good, guys. <laughs> I'll say y'all because I- What is it called? It. Right? What is that? So honestly, Strongly recommend. Yeah, so highly recommend that one. Also, um, I'm gonna try and show you the cover for this one. This is um, an arc called, mm -hmm. it's, it's there's no way to do it. <laughs> at Summer's yeah, exactly. End. My ring light's getting in the way, but it's called At Summer's End. It's by Courtney Ellis. She's a Berkeley sister at the same house as me. And it's coming out this summer. So you'll have to wait for it. But it's a Regency. And I don't usually read Regencies, but I'm loving it. It's so good. It's, it's Regencies awesome. are hot and, right now. But um, it's also very unique. And, and um, it, it's not formulaic at all. So I'm loving it. So that's Summer's End by Courtney Ellis. I believe it comes out in July or August. So I'm loving it so far. Okay. I haven't heard a recommendation for a Regency in a long time. And like we said, it's very hot right now. So I, mm -hmm. I'm going to write that title down. Well, we'll put them Where's all up best? on the on the page. For Greer, do you have something that you'd recommend that you're recommending yes. and loving? I am. I am. Almost done um, with this one, The Chanel Sisters by Judith Little. Yes. So um, I'm doing an event with Judith and uh, Serena Burdick, who wrote uh, Find Me in Havana. I'm doing an event with them next week. So I get to read their books ahead of time, which is fantastic. I was reading this in the bathtub. This is really good, like bathtub. Um, <laughs> were you wearing, only you wearing like your Chanel pearls when you were... Were you wearing your Chanel pearls when you were reading it? <laughs> I was well, not in the bathtub, but I was actually wearing my pearls earlier today. So I was wearing pearls when I was reading. <laughs> I love that. Well, we have a few announcements to get through, but please stay with us because we have one more question for Susan and Greer before we um, end our day. Uh, I just wanted to remind you guys about our amazing new Friends in Fiction jute totes that are. Um, a free gift with purchase if you purchase our Friends in Fiction first box from Oxford Exchange, or we have an option on our Facebook page under announcements about how you can submit a form after you pre-order all five books and we will send you your tote. So all the information, I actually did a little video for you guys so that you can have all the information and I wrote it out. So if you're 
no matter what kind of learner you are, you can, <laughs> um, you can, you can learn how to submit the form. It's not that complicated, but, um, no. but we really appreciate everyone who has pre-ordered and who has taken part in our friends in fiction first box. We're very excited about it. Yeah. It's really excited. And We've got I'm the excited. first one coming out. Yeah. Oh, and, um, book is just around the corner. Yep. Two yeah, weeks and six days. Yeah. But who's nine. counting? Who's counting? And, and <laughs> nine hours and four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so I am really excited to host about my book, but also <laughs> to host um, next week's episode with our incredible friend, Kristen Hanna. From the smashing success of The Four Winds to her Firefly Lane topping the Netflix charts, mm -hmm. we cannot wait to celebrate with her. And we will also have a bonus episode next week we're really excited about with Julia Kelly coming up the following Sunday. So it'll be a great week of doubleheader and we can't mm -hmm. wait to see you all there. Yeah, and a big congrats to Kristen for that. Um, this week's indie bookstore is Warwick's in La Jolla. La Jolla? La Jolla. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I said La Jolla. That's really bad. <laughs> Get 10% off at, in Warwick's in La Jolla this week on our forthcoming releases, The Arctic Fury and The Nature of Fragile Things. And use the code Warwick's Friends. And don't forget to add Mama Geraldine's to your cart this week so you'll be sure to have plenty of snacks to get through the long winter months. Or if your in-laws come while your husband and child are celebrating their birthday. Yeah. Um, so they're amazing. Um, and they actually also make great pasta toppings and macaroni I didn't and cheese toppings. That. Yeah, Please. like you just crumble crumble them up, especially mac and cheese. I'm just telling you, you know, yeah. do, do, mm -hmm. don't blame me when your mama Geraldine's intake goes up. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but so use the code FAB5 at mamageraldine's.com to get 20% off all your Ooh. online orders. And speaking of that Fab Five count uh, code, um, we don't know about you all, but I'm thinking that we are all friends and we are friends with anybody who will work for books like Brandy, the owner of Page One Books. So, um, and they are one of our partners on Friends in Fiction. We're grateful to them. So use Fab Five for 10% off on your hand-selected reading subscription. And you can find the link on our on our friends in fiction website facebook page so we have one final question for you guys so patty w warren another patty except she spells it wrong with a y <laughs> wants to know how did you find and it's so interesting this question because sue you talked about it a little bit but how did you find the place you wanted to start your book um so, Sue, you said that you you had to start it in a couple different places. You started three times. So why don't you go first and tell us how you decided exactly where you wanted to start it after all that drama? And then I want to hear from you, Greer. Right. Well, it's going to sound weird, but I was inspired by Leon Moriarty's Big Little Lies because if you watch the HBO um, adaptation of it, which was so wonderful, so it begins... Good. It begins with um, like almost like a police interview situation. So, you know, the story is about a, um, a death of a, of, a, of a man at a school event. And so there's all these parents coming into the camera angle describing what it was like that night. And I like this idea that it begins with a police interview. And so I and my, my book has a little bit of a big little eyes feel only in that it's about female solidarity. So my mail order bride whose world comes crashing down on her on the eve of the earthquake is going to end up meeting friends along the way that are going to help her protect what she loves. And so that idea mm -hmm. of female solidarity and the fact that women aren't as fragile as they look. And especially yeah. back in the turn of the century when they had little agency, they couldn't even own their own bank account. Um, they were seen as fragile creatures. Well, um, I turn that on its head. They're not. And so this idea that it, I might begin with a police interview appealed to me. So it does begin with a police interview. And my mail order bride, this is seven months post earthquake, her husband is missing. And so she's helping this detective, you know, they're, they're looking for him. And, uh, and, then, and then we go back to the beginning when she, when she first marries him. But it, so it begins with the police interview. And I, I, and I channeled that from the great Leon Moriarty. So what you did is you took a hook and you grabbed us and then we're suckers, yeah, we're done. Exactly. We're already hooked in. How about you, Greer? Where did you, where did you, how did you decide where to start? 
Yeah, mine is actually not that dissimilar because mine is it goes back and forth in time between the the actual expedition into the Arctic and then the murder trial that takes place a year later. So I had to choose, you know, do you start it with the expedition or do you start it with the murder trial? Of course, you start it with the murder trial. So yeah. the first line of the book is in the front row sit the survivors. Um, oh, so yeah, you that's know, right. You know, not everybody makes it mm -hmm. back from the very beginning. And I'm I'm not comparing myself to Toni Morrison in, in any way other than there's one book of hers, um, I think it's Paradise that starts with, they shot the white girl first mm -hmm. and it puts the riddle into your head and you yeah. read the entire book trying to figure out who it is that she's talking about in the very first line. Um, and so I really wanted to do, and it, it's so similar, Susan, I wanted, I was inspired by that and I thought, oh, I want my own riddle. So it's very different because this, it's a riddle with an answer. So you you find out there are survivors, they're in the front row, you find out there are only five of them um, in addition to the woman who's on trial for the murder. And so you get to spend the whole book going back and forth, like looking at the list of who's on the expedition and then finding out who's in the courtroom and just mentally ticking off to say, you know, who made it the whole way uh, and who didn't and what happened to the ones who didn't. So um, that that That's decision great. came very early on. It has never had a, a first line other than that first line. Okay. That well, I love that, I love that this is such a great pairing of authors because both of you have books that had catastrophes or weather or in, involved, but also you really had empowered women. Mm -hmm. You switched it. Mm -hmm. And I love that. So it's great to have you both individually and together. Thanks. Yeah. It certainly is. Yes. Okay, well, thank you awesome. to both of you, Greer and Susan, so much for coming on tonight, for sharing your insightful yeah. writing tips and what you're reading and the inside scoop on your new novels, which um, we really cannot recommend highly enough and hope that you're all running out to Warwick's to purchase them right now online. Um, we cannot wait to see everyone next week. When we'll be here with Kristen Hanna. In the meantime, Join us on our Facebook group, on Instagram, and on our podcast for special episodes that you won't find anywhere else. That's a wrap. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every Join us on every Facebook and Facebook or YouTube. Our live show our live show every Wednesday every night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 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 Eastern time. And please, and please subscribe to our subscribe. podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night. Love they that. were such good Hi, guys. Ladies. Ah, yeah, yeah but it, I mean, they're friends in real life, yeah. which is cool. So that's yeah. and the fact that they were yeah. writing such similar books was very, very exciting. Yeah. That was that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I was just. I was wondering about, I keep thinking about, oh my gosh, all our friends in Texas, I don't know if they have power tonight, yeah. if they have water yeah. running. I mean, you know, it's so sad. And of course, the first thing I thought about was, well, what would your pandemic, I mean, you know, what would your power outage, what would you eat? What would you find? How would you forage? It's... um. It's really, really rough. And I actually had an event last, I was supposed to have an event last night with Madeline Henry in, at Blue Willow Books in Houston. Oh, and yeah. They didn't have power. Oh, um, and no. I guess if they did, I think they're asking you to please not use power, you know. Um, oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. We had what, like a quarter of an inch of snow here in Alabama. And all day long, I kept saying, please, power, don't go out. Please, power, don't go out. Please, oh. power. Because it's not the weather. It's what happens when you don't. Yeah. yeah. I've been thinking a lot about the people in Texas, too. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. In Louisiana. I mean, I mean the whole. Yeah. And the yeah. Midwest expecting more snow. Yeah. It's, I wrote this essay about a little snowflake in my brother's um I thought it was so beautiful to see a snowflake and he's growling at me now. Like, what do you mean? One snowflake. One snowflake. Well, I wrote a column for parade next week about the unexpected joy of snow days. Which, but you um, know, it was perfect timing. It might was. not ring true. <laughs> well, but there you, is you know, for, for, for kids, for kids, it does. Cause that's, you know, yeah. that's, I think what you're talking about, like the, the joy of being a kid and that magic of, you know, yeah, the yeah. world kind of shutting down. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's, but, you know, yeah. one of my favorite children's books that I read to my kids over and over again, and then to my grandkids, Ezra Jack Keats, The Snowy yes. Day. Yes. Yep. The snowy oh my day. gosh. You I know they have this that in a long time. Yes, I, I, have I have them. Oh, do they? Oh. Yeah. With a the little red cap. 
It's oh, that's so the cute. snowball, the snowball melting in his pocket. Yeah. Oh, I, Kathy, Take I haven't heard of that. Oh, I loved that book. My gosh, what a good okay. mem memory. Uh, well, you I know what reminded me of it was was um, Christie's essay for next week. Yeah, for, makes so good. for parade.com. Yeah. I was thinking about the snowy day and when the little boy, um, you know, he has the snowball in his pocket. <laughs> and so you know the i the sense the sense that um he goes out and explores the world and he goes down the hill and then at the end of the day he goes and takes a bath and everything is good and don't you think that's what uh, that's what we all wish <laughs> yes yeah. that's what we're hoping is going to be at the end of the pandemic right right we get, we get in the bath and we're like okay we got through that <laughs> We, yeah, did exactly. we did that. We did that. Well, I have to say, I loved their writing tips, both of them. Yes, yeah. I yes. Mm -hmm. I have to try. I, I have to try that dictating into notes app. I don't yeah. know. And dialogue. That's what people love to read more yeah. and more. But and I, that's. I, yeah. Yeah. No, you're totally right. I, I'm scared to do it though. Like I'm, I'm, I'm scared that the ideas won't come out the right way or, or come out the same way. You know what I mean? That there's. Well, just something I, about the brain to finger connection mm -hmm. that has to be there for me, but maybe not. I, don't <laughs> I think so. Maybe too. not. Yeah. So maybe. I was, here's a, here's a story. Mm -hmm. I was staying at Mary Kay Andrews house in Atlanta, Georgia, and she was off on doing something. And I took a walk and went to downtown Avondale in search of coffee. <laughs> and I had this total, because it was quiet and I was by myself, I had a total brainstorm about how I wanted to end a book that isn't out yet. And I pulled out my notes and I dictated while I was walking. And it is part of the end of the book. The you know, oh, stories. oh, good. So when mm -hmm. she told that story, I was mm -hmm. like, I, yeah. I haven't done it since. Yeah. But I was afraid I was going to lose it. So mm -hmm. I put it, I verbaled oh, it, you know, did a verbal into the notes. Yeah. So I think we should try it more. We should all do one yeah. of our sprints. We go, okay, ready? Got your phones okay. ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's get set, Thanks, go. Friend. Yeah, well, you know, I got I've got a four hour drive to Tybee tomorrow. So maybe I'll dictate four hours of notes. <laughs> oh my gosh. You'll have to let us know how many words you got. <laughs> or maybe I'll finish, maybe I'll finish listening to, I'm listening to Tana French, uh, the searcher oh, yeah. so on audio. Cause we're going to have her on a podcast. So if I don't dictate my own book, maybe I'll just finish listening to hers. That you know, I actually did. I was on the beach. I was walking on the beach and I just had this idea for the scene and under the Southern sky. And I did dictate that. And I did actually get home and think, oh yeah. And it's still in the book. So oh, see, see, there you are. That's All right, we're on. We so that was it. Susan's tip or was that yeah. Greer's tip? That was Susan's, Susan's tip. Yeah. Thank you, and Susan. And you know, sometimes you think, oh, I'll remember that. That's such you a don't great don't idea. Know. I'll remember and it. Don't yeah. know. And don't an hour later, you're like, Oh, I should have yeah. written that down. And then you're convinced yeah. that it was the most genius idea you ever had, and now it's gone forever. No, it's and now gone. It flew away, away. Exactly. and it flew to somebody else, and it's in their book. That's right. Now. Genius is so yeah. fickle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now Mary Kay is writing it right now. I know. It flew to her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell what me if they said <laughs> it landed in her notebook. I always okay. tell people, you know, I have so many pe people will um, say, I have an idea for a book. And um, how about I, I tell it to you and we split the money? Yes, <laughs> me too. And I'm like, someone not clear on the concept the of writing a book. <laughs> and I, and I, so at some point, I think I sometimes. If it's um, if I'm cranky enough, I'll say, you know what, ideas are a dime a dozen. Until you write the until you write the book, it's not really an idea. An idea is a sentence. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. When you've written three hundred pages, come back to me. Mm -hmm. Right. Ooh, <laughs> and guess what? Turn. We could we there could be one idea and give it to all five of us, and you're going to get five completely yeah. different yeah. notes. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, well, which kind of what happened with the person. anthology. I mean, they yeah. a reunion on a beach, and look at all the ideas we came up with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally so different. We should do that—a little writing challenge where we start with like one a one sentence idea, and each of us has to write a prompt, like a short story. Yeah, yeah anthology. Like in all of our free time, you guys. Yeah, all of our, yeah. well, no, so we want to do an anthology yeah. someday. We'll just, you know. Yeah, Maybe we should ask our readers to what do you want to hear us yeah, write about? Yeah, that's you guys, great. leave it in the comments. If we were to write a book together or an yeah. anthology, 
what would you want it to be about? What would it be? Exactly. This is not an announcement, though. No. Not an announcement. announcement. Well, it's not a promise, but a prospect. (laughs) Also, if if anybody out there has a way to create more hours in the day, we would be open to hearing that, too. Or clone. That would be good, too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, My turn out. Or how not, or how not to sleep. No, yeah. yeah my agent has, I've mastered that. <laughs> yeah, my agent has taken to texting me. What's the word count for the day? Oh my gosh! Oh. Really? It's time for that. It's that time. Oh dear, you're ahead of the game, girlfriend. Wait, 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 wait. I, oh, I've got a book like for means- summer of 22 to to write. I feel oh. like that means we're not doing our job by having you report your word count to us. Ladies, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody else is, yeah, somebody else's turn to be the sheriff. I am passing the badge. Yeah, because okay. you, you were the sheriff. You done good. You done summer. good. Yep, yep. You were. Right, I'm I'll, passing the badge. I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll Kristen, take, you're I'll take that Chinese card. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, Kristen, I can see this Kristen happening is the now. Acting, Kristen is I'm the acting good. high sheriff. I'm a little bit unmean. <laughs> Got it. I'm gonna go get my. I'm gonna go. My wine glass is empty, y'all. All All right. I love you. Thank you. you So good to see you. I love Love you. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.